So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I will uh, wait for another one minute before we start, uh, because my experience is that in the first few minutes, some uh, new participants uh, join after they come from uh, another session. So, I want to wait, uh, say, one minute before we actually start. <clears throat> Okay, um, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the XC22 session on availability and safety number two. I'm uh, Shahar Maoz. I'm a professor at uh, Tel Aviv University. Um, specifically, my research interests are in uh, applying formal methods to software engineering, uh, modeling, and this kind of uh, stuff. Uh, I served on the XC program committee and I will be chairing this uh, session. We have uh, an excellent program of uh, six uh, different presentations coming uh, also from different XC tracks. Uh, one journal first paper, uh, one new ideas track paper, and three, uh, four uh, technical track uh, papers. Uh, all the papers are related to reliability and safety, but in, in many different ways. Uh, in the coming hour, we will have six presentations of five minutes each, followed by a discussion. Uh, during the presentations, you are very welcome to write questions you may have to the speakers, uh, so that speakers can answer them during the discussion or in the chat itself. Uh, given that we have six different talks, please do not wait with your questions. It's very useful to write them down in the chat. And then um, this, these questions can serve as a, a starting point for your discussion. Um, when you write a question in the chat also, it's useful to um, start with the name of the speaker that this question is addressed to. And last word before we start, I'll be managing the time, of course, as a session chair uh, to keep us on schedule. So I will ask the presenters to keep their talks within the five minutes uh, limit as planned. Uh, I'll give a reminder about uh, the time if necessary, but I hope that it will not be necessary. So uh, we're ready to start with the first presentation. Um, by Felix about uh, Taint Bench, and that's a journal first paper. Please, Felix. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Well, yes, journal first paper with the title Taint Bench Automatic Real World or Web Benchmarking of Android Taint Analysis. So, what is a benchmark in the context of Android Taint Analysis? Well, imagine you have your benchmark app. And in there, you have so-called sources, statements that extract sensitive information, for example, your device's location or your contact data. This is sensitive data, and you don't want it to be leaked at a sink that, for example, uploads data to the internet. So in a benchmark or a benchmark suit for Android now, you have dozens or hundreds, even thousands of these apps. And for each app to be usable as a benchmark, we have to document the ground truth or baseline in terms of benchmark cases. So here we have two examples. The context source, for example, is connected to the sink. So we expect that this benchmark case, that this taint flow is found. That's why it is an expected benchmark case. On the other hand, we have unexpected benchmark cases. For example, the GPS source is not connected to the uh, internet sink. So if an analysis tool would find that connection, identify it as a taint flow, that would actually be a false positive and we have to uh, declare such cases in our um, benchmark to be able to detect them automatically. As a first contribution of our Taint Bench study, we came up with our own benchmark suit known as Taint Bench Suit. So we started with a repository of more than 300 malware apps and inspected um, them during a long lasting process and finally ended up with 
39 benchmark gaps. For these, we almost documented 250 benchmark cases, of which roughly 200 are expected, and the remaining are unexpected cases. The whole suit with a lot of more information is available on our GitHub page, and you can also inspect the cases online, have a look at what chain flows are documented, etc. The second part of our contribution is the framework, the chain batch framework. It supports you with three phases of benchmarking. The first phase is the construction or the um, extension of benchmarks. So you can take taint bench or construct a new benchmark via um, JUDX or the plugin we added to JUDX that allows you to document taint flows inside the GUI. So just like in an IDE, you can mark statements from where to where the taint flows are going and put them and output them as a benchmark case. Then in the second phase, we uh, support you with the evaluation. Therefore, we extended repro ReproDroid, such as it takes the output of the first phase and directly generates you an executable benchmark that you can execute for all sorts of taint analysis tools. And finally, for the inspection phase, we wrote a Visual Studio Code plugin that allows you to inspect the outcome of the first and the second phase and to compare both of them against each other. And again, also this part, the framework is available on our website. Having that suit and um, this framework, we conducted some evaluations to show that it is really worth to employ taint bench. So here on this slide, we see uh, two experiments, one dealing with Droid bench, which is a state-of-the-art micro benchmark for Android taint analysis, and our new benchmark taint bench. Um, with the, the different um, charts show the accuracy metrics precision recall and F measure, and the tools we are considering here is a Mandroid and Flowdroid. We took both tools in two different versions, and the one always masked with the, marked with the asterisk at the end is always a newer version. So if we take a look at the results, first of all, here for precision, we already see that the um, precision in case of taint batch is much lower than in case of dry batch. This becomes more obvious when we could, uh, take a look at recall and consequently at F measure. Here, all the values drop when we switch from one benchmark to another. So one could guess that the benchmarks are over adapted to micro benchmarks. So we wanted to find out if that is really the case. So what we are starting with here are two different experiments dealing with Droid Bench, the micro benchmark. And um, we on purpose over adapted the tools to be perfectly suited for, for this benchmark. And as we can see with um, a little bit of adaption, we get better accuracy values. We did the same with, with a little bit more effort and more experiments for Tink Bench to try to achieve the same values as for Droid Bench. Well, let's ignore precision for now. It's a little bit counterintuitive, but if we take a look at recall and F measure, we see the more we over adapt the tool, the better it gets, of course. Okay, and um, if we compare now the results for Droid Bench and Tink Bench, we still have that drop in accuracy. So still, with adapting both tools to the respective benchmarks, the tools are way more precise on the micro benchmarks. So probably this question mark at the end of this question actually could become an exclamation mark. What we know for sure is that the source and sync lists these tools use are crucial. There is no perfect source and sync list, but they highly um, influence the outcome of an analysis because that's basically the part we adapted for on purpose over adaption. Okay, and we had a second result, which was kind of surprising to us. Well, first, let's take a look at the dark bars here again, that is Droid Bench. And as we can see it with our own eyesight, here are some drops when we switch from the old version of a Mandroid to the new version of a Mandroid. So there are regressions that we could, or that could already have been detected with Droid Bench. If we take a look at the Taint Bench results now, we see a lot more of this drop. Basically, all across the board for both tools, we see that the newer versions are less precise than or less accurate than their, um, than their uh, earlier versions. Okay, that's it already. I shortly presented to you the Taint Bash suit framework and the evaluation we conducted with it. Everything is available on our website and I'm looking forward to answering your questions. So, see you later. Okay, uh, thank you, Felix. Um, the next uh, speaker is uh, Sanjita, uh, who is going to present a new ideas paper on uh, how we training with the right data. Yeah. Uh, can you see my screen? I can. Yeah, yes, I can see it. Okay. Thank you. 
Hello, my name is Sangeeta De. I'm a PhD student of Ajay University in South Korea. I'm going to present our paper, uh, Are We Training with the Right Data? Evaluating Collective Confidence in Training Data Using Denster Shepherd Theory. This paper is written by me and my advisor, Professor Shiok Wang Lee. As we know, in the days of AI, we are um, uh, machine learning models are trained with heavy data, and those uh, the uh, the, the, the output of the machine learning model depends on the quality of the data. Therefore, in this paper, we argue that we should understand the data first, especially in case of um, safety critical systems. It, if the training data quality is not good, then it will end up with unreliable results. Therefore, we should ask the question, are we working with the right data? However, currently there is no practice of systematic training data fitness assessment before engaging in machine learning training. Uh, therefore, in this work, we try to uh, cover three aspects. One is intellectual diversity, that means including experts of diverse uh, background in the process of fitness assessment. Next is uncertainty, data uncertainty uh, coming from of coverage, etc., and epistemic uncertainty due to lack of knowledge and disagreement among the uh, experts. And finally, we want to uh, calculate the quantify the experts' combined belief and conf or confidence on whether the collected data is safe or dependable enough to be used for training purpose or not. And we use Caltech and JAB datasets as uh, running examples for pedestrian detection feature of autonomous cars. Um, as such, fitness assessments are often subjective and we don't have binary answers. Therefore, we use a denster shepherd theory. Uh, as you can see that in case of traditional probability theory, if we have to answer that who was the killer based on certain evidences, we can only show it in terms of uh, singleton sets like this. Uh, whereas in case of denster shepherd theory, we can uh, express our mass belief, that is M, and we also can express it in terms of sets that has multiple uh, elements. So we can express that, uh, Okay, Jim is the killer for sure, or the, our disbelief that Jim is not the killer, or the uncertainty that Jim may be the killer. And this is the proposed method. Uh, before data collection, uh, we suggest that the data expert, machine learning expert, and domain experts have to collaborate and understand the sources of uncertainty and set criteria to minimize their impact. For example, it looks like this in the context of pedestrian detection, that the training data should reduce the representation gap, lack of data coverage, et cetera. And for each of these sources of uncertainty, there is certain criteria that they have to meet. Second, once the data is collected, the data expert is expected to perform the early exploratory data analysis and collect evidence to support, uh, to related to the claim that uncertainty has been minimized. And component level expert and uh, domain expert should uh, evaluate each, each uh, evidences individually and categorize them as positive, negative, or inconclusive. So for each criteria, there will be evidence and the, the experts will categorize them as positive or negative. Uh, and finally, we use uh, Dempster Schiffer theory to combine individual belief masses uh, and get the collective confidence. As you can see um, uh, here, the machine learning component level experts and system level experts individually give their opinion about each evidence. There may not be in agreement, so that it can be different. So, for example, the, the the positive evidences adds on to the belief mass that the data is safe. The negative evidences adds on to the belief mass that the data is not safe, and inconclusive ones adds on to the uncertainty. And the, we use Yeager's rule to uh, calculate the collective belief um, in the proposition that the data is safe. As you can see, this is not a mere summation. Uh, it also it it just not only doesn't only sum up the belief mass in the safe, uh, but also it uh, considers the belief mass that is hidden in the uncertainty window. As uh, you can see here, we try to show some examples. Um, uh, we perform this method and try to see how much uncertainty we have for, we find for Caltech dataset and, and JAR dataset. Caltech dataset has been extensively used by uh, various co computer vision experts. However, we can see it has lackings in terms of representing uh, the domain variability. Uh, so it, uh, it has a significant window of uncertainty. Compared to that, uh, JAD dataset, which is more diverse, it covers more environmental diversity, diversity in poses, accessories, etc. We could collect more positive evidences and the uncertainty window got reduced. 
So to sum up our contribution, we attempted to assess the fitness of the training data before get going into before getting into rig uh, rigorous training process. We use Dem Demster Schaefer theory for the purpose. It can enhance. It has potential to enhance the explainability and traceability as we have the arguments, evidence, and the claims. It will be useful for safety assurance, and we we believe that requirements engineering process can play an important role. And currently, we are working on that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Sanjita. Very interesting talk. Um, the next uh, speaker uh, is uh, Hao Chen, uh, presenting a technical track paper uh, on performance tuning. Please. Uh, we cannot hear you. Um, Sorry, uh, you, you might want to unmute, unmute yourself. Uh, um, the speaker, please unmute yourself. We cannot hear you. Okay, uh, from the icon, it says you are unmuted. Can you try to say something? Okay, can you hear me? Um, a yes, bit? now I now now we can. Yes, I can. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Okay. Oh, okay. So Sorry. please start. Uh, okay. Uh, this um, I'm I'm Hao Chen. I'm very glad to share uh, our work with you. Uh, the work is tower to a limitation of current performance tuning tools uh, that they usually only focus on performance, but not aware of other important user intentions. Uh, in production, users usually use configurations to satisfy their intentions. Common intentions are like increasing performance. Uh, keeping reliability or enhancing security. As the scale of software system becomes larger, the number of configuration parameters increases rapidly, and the number even goes beyond a thousand in some software. It is, it is obviously uh, impossible for users themselves to, cho to choose from hundreds to thousands of parameters to fulfill their intentions. So many works have been proposed to alleviate this problem. They build performance models or train auto tuners to help uh, to help users improve performance, but the efficiency of these tuners is, is extremely limited by the combinatorial explosion problem of uh, configuration parameters. Uh, so some works pre-select some important uh, some pre-select some performance related parameters to reduce the search space via performance testing and machine learning techniques. However, this uh, both of these works pre-select uh, both this pre-selection method and the auto-tuning method only consider performance while ignoring other user intentions. In fact, many parameters have more than one side of impacts on other on user intentions. For example, in MySQL, the parameter you know, DB flush lock at transaction commit controls the trade-off between ACID compliance and performance. That is to say, this method may possibly may possible put users at a risk of bad issues like data loss. This this is the main problems we are targeting on in this paper. And from the efficiency perspective, this method relies on performance testing, which is also very heavy that limit their usefulness. In conclusion, a method a method that takes multi intentions into consideration and the selecting configuration parameters in a lightweight method is needed. So we propose SafeTune, an approach that pre-selecting uh, performance-related parameters with aware of other user intentions, like keeping reliability. The usage of SafeTune is, is to help performance tuners to improve efficiency as well as warm potential violations on user intentions. Uh, as we can see here, uh, configuration documents are official description of configuration parameters. Most mature software systems are equipped with these sort documents. So the insight uh, is that the configuration document usually contains useful information that generally explain the, the, the impact on user intentions. For these parameters marked here, it is documented to have impact on both performance and reliability. Another advantage of document is that uh, it's more lightweight, so it does not need heavy performance testing. So the main idea of, main idea of SafeTune is to mine the relationship between performance and other intentions 
from the configuration documents. Uh, therefore, we made an empirical, empirical study on more than 7,000 configuration parameters and find out that majority performance related, par related parameters indeed affect uh, other user intentions. And there are six types of intentions that may get affected. So based on the finding, uh, we build a model to infer the side effects on user intentions given the configuration documents. Uh, the model applies a semi-supervised method to reduce a labeling effort and use a simple machine learning method to understand the semantics in the documents. And though simple, it can still achieve good results. Uh, the comparison with the state-of-art method in Hot Storage 20 shows that SafeTune can not only cover most parameters find, them, find by them, but also find 20 more parameters that have significant impact missed by them. We also evaluate safety on the effectiveness on helping a popular tuning tool. Uh, the result shows that with safety, uh, 12 severe side effects uh, like, like potential uh, data corruption in case A can be prevented. In this paper, uh, we argue that future tools should pay more attention on the tuning, uh, on tuning with other targets, uh, inten target intentions like reliability or resource usage. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hao Chen. Uh, very interesting uh, work. Um, and we're moving uh, directly to uh, the fourth uh, presentation for today. Uh, another paper from the technical track, uh, another paper on performance. Um, please, uh, Jing Su. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, looks yeah. good. Okay, oh, so let's start. So hello everyone, I'm Jing Ru from Shanghai Tech University. Today I will present PerfSeq, Extracting Performance Bug Signatures by Multimodality Causal Analysis. Performance bugs are inevitable in cloud systems. They often cause serious service outages. During our empirical study, we observed that many performance bugs repeatedly occur in different versions of cloud systems, which can cause redundant debug. Moreover, microservices using containers make the bug replication easier than ever because the same bug can occur in multiple containers which are created from the same container image. Based on the two observations, Performance bug signatures can help system operators quickly identify recurrent bugs and provide useful diagnostic information for developers. Previous work on performance bug diagnosis has two major limitations. First, previous work mainly focused on depicting performance bugs over a single data type. Second, the existing tools are not application agnostic. We use a real Hadoop bug to illustrate how a performance bug happens and how it manifests in machine data. The root cause of this bug is here. The root function is this function. It, uh, it passes zero timeout value to the configuration incorrectly, and zero means never timeout. Therefore, when the name node experiences some unexpected problems, such as network outages, the data node hands on waiting for the response from the name node. We observe that when the bug happens, no anomaly pattern manifests at the data node side. Instead, at the name node side, the log entries produced by server stopping are missing. So even if developers can discover the missing log anomaly pattern at the name node side, it's still difficult for them to pinpoint the root cause function, which is located at the data node side. To address this problem, we present PerfSeq, an automatic performance bug signature extraction tool which performs multimodality data analysis. When a performance alert is generated, PerfSeq is triggered to analyze recent machine data, 
including system metrics, system logs, and function culture. For system metrics, such as CPU usage, ProfSig adopts low-pass filter to remove random fluctuation from dynamic workloads. And then ProfSig leverages signal processing techniques and unsupervised machine learning to identify fine-grained anomaly patterns. For system logs, ProfSig leverages semantics-based grouping, which is word-embedding, to classify logs generated by different tasks. Then ProfSig conducts frequent sequence mining to extract log sequences. Then ProfSig uses the log sequences to identify log anomaly patterns. After pattern detection, ProfSig performs causal analysis between the detected anomaly patterns and the function call traces using information theory method, which is mutual information. The goal is to identify the root cause function, which is the top contributor to the anomaly pattern. Lastly, ProfSig outputs the performance bug signature as a combination of the detected anomaly pattern and the pinpointed root cause function. We have reproduced 20 real performance bugs from six commonly used cloud systems. We can see six out of 20 reproduced bugs are distributed performance bugs. 15 bugs are hand bugs and five bugs for bugs which have system metric anomalies, ProfSig can identify three different anomaly patterns in 11 tested bugs. This now ranks of root cause functions using causal analysis. We find ProfSig outperforms other alternative approaches. For bugs which have system log anomalies, ProfSig can identify two anomaly patterns from eight out of nine bugs. The results show that ProfSig outperforms the alternative log analysis approaches. To conclude, ProfSig is a multimodality performance bug signature extraction framework. We have described fine-grained anomaly detection methods to capture manifestation of performance bugs. We have conducted causal analysis across different machine data using information theory method to pinpoint the root cause function. We have evaluated over 20 performance bugs occurred on six cloud systems, and ProfSig can produce precise signatures for 19 out of them. That's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Jing Su. Uh, I remind everyone uh, if you have questions to the speakers, uh, please uh, uh, don't wait. Uh, uh, you, you can already write them down in the chat. And now we move to the fifth uh, presentation, uh, another technical track uh, paper. Uh, please, uh, Renju. Yeah, is everything OK? Yes. Please okay. start. OK. Hi, I'm Ren Jue Li from Institute of Software, Chinese Academy of Sciences. It's my pleasure to share our recent work on neural network robustness analysis. The paper title is Towards Practical Robustness Analysis for DNNs Based on PAC Model Learning, and we named the method DPAC. When we talk about the robustness of a deep neural network, <clears throat> we want to study the output of the DNN in the neighborhood of the inputs. In this paper, we analyze the local robustness regarding a single input. So a critical measure is the maximum robustness radius where a DNN can hold its robustness. The problem here is to estimate it. Here we review some existing methods to estimate the maximum robustness radius. Traditional verification-based method can hardly satisfy the large DNNs in production. Adversarial attacks have no guarantee on its estimation, while the statistical method is often imprecise due to a huge, a huge input space. So what, what we do is to solve the problem from the perspective of model learning. Imagine a surrogate model which is extremely similar to the original DNN. If we can verify the robustness of the surrogate model, we may transfer the property to the original DNN. Here, we present our framework. 
the main idea of our paper is to learn a good enough model which abstracts load code behavior about the robustness of the original DN, then analyze the robustness on the learned model. Since we want to estimate the robustness with some guarantee, we must define the meaning of good enough. Here, we bridge the learned model with the original DN by a probably approximately correct, PEC for short, guarantee. The, abs the absolute error between the learned model and the original model is bounded by lambda with the confidence at least 1 minus eta, and the error rate at most, epsilon. What we learn here is the score difference function of the original DN denoted by delta. The score difference function is a good indicator of the robustness as the score difference is smaller than zero, the model is robust. So we will learn its surrogate delta prime under the pack guarantee using the scenario optimization technique. After learning the surrogate model, we say the original model is pack model robust if the surrogate model plus the margin lambda is smaller than zero in the neighborhood B. Since we learned an affine model, so the property can be easily checked. Now we show some of the experiment results in our paper. We first evaluate the four methods on MINIST. In most cases, the maximum robustness estimation given by Provero is even larger than the upper bound identified by PGD. In contrast, DPAC estimates the maximum robustness radius more accurately, which falls in between the results from Iran and PGD mostly. Since the range between the estimation of Iran and PGD contains the exact maximum robustness radius, we conclude that DPAC is a more accurate tool than Provero to analyze local robustness of DNs. We also run DPAC on larger datasets and the networks. We test on CIFAR-10 ResNets with different parameter settings. We found that the results are relatively stable and DPAC shows good tolerance to parameters. The ImageNet experiment shows our framework is efficient and scalable. In future work, we want to improve our framework in multiple aspects, considering more complex input regions, stronger surrogate model templates, and extending TPAC to other properties. For more details and results, please refer to our XC paper. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Renju, for keeping your uh, presentation uh, on time. Um, yeah, and uh, we're ready to move to the last uh, presentation, um, uh, a technical track paper presentation on analyzing user perspectives on mobile app privacy and scale. Yeah, thank you. Please, Preksha. Yeah, Thanks. you can start. Yeah. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Preksha. I'm from Google Research Bangalore, and uh, this is our work which is jointly done with uh, folks in Google Research Zurich and uh, Mountain View. Uh, it is about analyzing users' perspective on mobile app privacy at scale. Uh, yeah, so uh, the unstructured play reviews that are present in uh, Play Store or uh, for any other app, they are typically analyzed at scale. Uh, to extract product requirements. And uh, the previous works do not focus on the privacy aspect uh, of these reviews. And the works that they uh, do focus on the privacy, they rely on qualitative and quantitative surveys to provide certain privacy insights uh, that the user uh, raise, but they are again limited in terms of scale. So there is a need to uh, automate this process to analyze these privacy insights at scale so that we can learn a lot more about user feedback with respect to the their privacy concerns. So in this work, uh, we propose this methodology uh, to uh, specifically uh, build a classifier that is able to identify which of the reviews are privacy specific and which are which aren't. And once we have analyzed these privacy, we have classified these privacy reviews, we want to kind of summarize them and cluster them into categories, which 
reflect the same privacy concern that uh, a number of users are raising. And for these two steps, the first step is uh, data set curation because uh, as you know that the play reviews or the reviews that are mentioned in Play Store, they typically don't have these tags associated with their privacy or not privacy aspect. So data set curation is also one of the major contributions from our end. So for the first step of data set curation, we collected around 580 million play reviews from Play Store between April 2014 to 2020. And we had anon anonymized these play reviews with respect to app names and also user information was also redacted from these reviews. And these reviews were only labeled based on their app category, like whether they belong to games or location, uh, uh, some maps and navigation application and things like that. But they were still unlabeled with respect to the privacy and not privacy aspect. So how do we curate this test validation and training set for privacy and not privacy reviews? The other problem uh, with this data set is that uh, previous works have highlighted that only 1% of these reviews are actually related to privacy and the others aren't. So now to create a good quality balance set, we utilize these privacy taxonomies that are again present in the existing literature where they have mentioned certain engrams which are associated with the privacy aspect of these reviews. If we define these uh, n-gram lists to avoid uh, false positives from uh, this curation, and then we pass on this uh, refined, uh, like some, some of these potential privacy reviews that are sampled using these n-grams to expert hand labeling, where we label around 11k uh, reviews and we get like a good quality gold validation and test set where the numbers with the specific labels are given. So to build the privacy and not privacy classifier, we use sophisticated natural language understanding pipeline. Specifically, our models are based on BERT and uh, use representations because some things can be privacy without even using certain privacy uh, words. Like for this example, you don't uh, let it use my or use your information. There is no privacy keyword that is reflected in this review, but uh, they are talking about using of their personal information in this review. So we built uh, three different classifiers for uh, our work. Uh, one was based on universal sentence encoder that uses data set from Reddit uh, for the classifier. Then the other is word based and word sentiment based because sometimes privacy reviews are uh, associated with negative sentiment. So we uh, also use sentiment information as well. And the ensemble model for all, uh, based on all these three models was used to improve confidence in privacy uh, review identification. So as you can see that the ensemble model was giving a very high precision in identifying which of them are uh, privacy specific reviews and there were lesser false positives. So we used uh, the ensemble model to identify privacy reviews. And uh, this goes beyond the regex classification, uh, like the number of reviews that are identified as privacy are a lot more using our classifier. In the next step, we do a clustering and summarization of these privacy reviews, where we simply use an unsupervised clustering method, k-means clustering. Uh, since the finer privacy themes, that whether it is related to personal information or tracking, these things aren't labeled again. And we also proposed a summarization metric to identify the correct value of K. For more details, it could be found in the paper. And what we saw is that uh, based on the clustering that we did for different app categories, these were some of the prevalent issues that we identified. Permissions, uh, use of more personal information. Uh, then there were some related to privacy controls, tracking and selling data. And there were also certain privacy positive reviews that we identified where the user were able to acknowledge that there were good privacy controls that are being presented. And all in all, uh, now this, met this method could be used to kind of summarize these privacy feedback that we have. And uh, uh, they could raise these concerns to the app developers to uh, kind of work on the uh, privacy specific concerns that the users have on their app. And yeah, uh, this is pretty much from my end. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Preksha. Um, 
Thank you very much, uh, all the speakers. So now uh, it's the time for uh, our discussion. Are there? Um, I already wrote a few questions uh, that I have uh, in the chat, and I have more. Um, are there any questions from uh, uh, the audience, from one presenter to another, or should we go over my questions first? I'll, okay. I'll start. Yeah. Anyone? Yeah, sure. We start as, with, with the question in the chat, right? Um, okay. Yeah. So I, I'll I'll read aloud uh, my first question there. It's a question to Felix. Uh, in the paper, you mentioned that some competing tools, most recent versions are less accurate than previous versions of these competing tools, if I understand correctly. And uh, this is something that uh, seems like re requires an explanation. Uh, and also, maybe it affected your results, right? Yeah. So, uh, well, we expect it's opposite, of course. So we expected the newer tools to be better, actually. To to uh, be more accurate. So that was surprising, and in that way, it affected our uh, results. How can we explain this? Well, on the one hand, we were developing the benchmark to detect such things. So we were not highly interested in the reasons causing it, but of course, we were curious. So we looked into the executions and tried to find out what is happening there. And um, yeah, in case of Flowdroid, it's just because um, they have a new version. There seems to be some bug somewhere, and for uh, many applications, it cannot find an analysis entry point anymore. So the analysis simply doesn't start in the newer version. Mm -hmm. So that's that's just a, a technical problem, and we are observing newer versions now where this bug is already fixed and it it is improved. Mm -hmm. But it could have been avoided if the benchmark Tain Bench would have been uh, used before. So in, in particular, mm -hmm. Flowdroid is using Droid Bench, but with this benchmark, this uh, bug was just undetected. And in in uh, case of a Android, that were similar explanations. I see. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, a question to Sanjita. Um, yeah. Yeah. So oh, uh, I wonder uh, uh, which parts of your proposed method are automated already or can be automated. Yeah. Thank you. Good question. Uh, actually, this is. Um, this is an eye track paper. So when we wrote this paper, we just had the idea of how we can use uh, dempster Schaefer theory to uh, calculate the collective confidence. So to answer the first part of your question that no, none of the part is now uh, automated. But uh, as a matter of fact, just last week, we were having a discussion on how we can automate it. So if you see our work, it has two main parts. One is uh, some data expert has to do the analysis on the data and collect the evidences. And on the second half, the experts have to give their opinion on the on the um, evidences, right? We categorize those evidences. So the second part is quite straightforward to automate because we were thinking like, if you really see applying the Stasheva theory and calculating, it's uh, it, it can be automated very, you know, it, it's not very complex because uh, mm -hmm. we can just uh, have a web-based application where people can provide their opinion and then can have a program that will automatically calculate the you know the belief the disbelief and uncertainty that's quite straightforward so first of all that can be done uh, what can be very difficult and we haven't thought of it is that if uh, we can ease the process of data analysis in any way that we haven't actually uh, started working on it uh, because we, if we can provide some kind of help to the data experts um, or some kind of guidance on how they can collect uh, the evidences that are relevant and they can ignore the irrelevant evidences save their time that we haven't actually thought of but as of now uh, because i when i was doing the calculation i really felt like we need some sort of automated tool which will do this calculation uh, you know uh, mm -hmm. by itself so that is uh, we are looking forward to we were working on it actually I see. thank you thank you so much um, I can continue with my questions, of course, but are there any uh, questions from the audience to any of the speakers? Okay, um, well. If I can uh, ask, yes. uh, sorry, sure. if I can ask one question to Renju, maybe. Yeah. Uh, in your last slide, you have uh, shown that in future, probably you would, you are interested in uh, checking other properties of the neural network for robustness analysis. If you can just, just I'm just curious if you can explain uh, like uh, what you were 
like what's your future plan and what are the other properties that you are uh, planning to assess yeah yeah okay for 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 example so uh, like fairness fairness are quite you, you know a hot topic in DN and testing or verification. So uh, to to your question, so other properties like fairness, fairness are a good example, right? And uh, another thing is like you know uh, how to explain the DN, how to explain its behavior. So we if we can learn a very similar surrogate model, we can anal analyze the, the such explain explainability on the surrogate mm -hmm. model and then transfer it to the original DN. This is what we are going to do. And uh, I think is uh, is kind of pr promising. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Uh, so uh, another question, uh, uh, this time about uh, PerfSig. Uh, the presentation by Jing Su. Uh, so the benchmark you used includes 20 bugs. And I, I'm not uh, in this field, I'm not an expert in this field, but 20 uh, looks like uh, not a very high number for the size of a benchmark. Um, can you elaborate on how you created it? Or are, aren't there um, existing benchmarks with um, uh, performance uh, bugs that you could use? Mm -hmm. uh, so we collect those performance bugs by searching, uh, by, by just do searching in uh, public bug repositories like Bugzilla, Apache Jira. So we use several keywords like uh, performance, hand, uh, block, slowdown, something like that, because mm -hmm. we, we, we define Bugs as software bugs, which cause performance degradation. We mainly talk about the hand and the slowdown bugs. And after do such kind of uh, searching, and then we uh, do do some manual checking, checking the bug patch to determine whether this is a, a performance bug indeed. And after that, we try to reproduce them because we needed to. Um, collect those uh, machine data during the runtime, like system metrics, mm -hmm. the system logs, uh, function call traces. So to the best of our effort, we have reproduced the 20 uh, performance bugs. So um, benchmark set, so maybe you can uh, search for some uh, performance bug benchmarks by maybe some empirical study paper. Uh, those papers can include benchmarks which uh, contain like a performance bug uh, reports, something like that. But here we you collect we collected those bugs and we needed to reproduce bugs and we needed mm. to um, co collect three kinds of machine data. So uh, to the best of our knowledge, there is no such kind of benchmarks which release so many kinds of machine data. So that's one of our contribution to collect various machine data and conduct the causal analysis across them. I see. Okay. Um, yeah. So yeah, I have a, a question for uh, Sanjinta. And uh, uh, according to your paper that I found the newer, you know, the newer data set, JAD is kind of more safe. Uh, so have you tried to train the same model on these two data sets and test them for performance? Like you, 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 like you, you, you analyze, uh, analyze that the later uh, data sets is more safe. So how, how is that? Uh, no, not really. I, we haven't implemented uh, the models or trained with that. Uh, what we did uh, was uh, we read other computer vision uh, based papers which have used these uh, data sets and even a very recent um, recent work which shows that uh, the reliability of the models actually fluctuate based on which data we use. So once uh, we uh, 
not necessarily mean that, okay, if you train with diverse data, it will give you the best results. In fact, if you train or test with the diverse data, it might actually give you bad results. But the point here is, are we knowing, are we aware of it? Are, are we getting the information that, okay, we have trained with a very good set of data and we are testing with a good set of data and this is what is the performance. So our point here is that getting reliable, um, you know, output. It doesn't mean that it is the best output or it will always like outperform all other models. No, that's not our target. We are trying to say that if we have if we have a good set of data and if we get the, the ranking of the models, then okay, we are we are good to go or we have the you know right understanding of the strength of the models. Because if we are training with the bad data, then even if some some model is outperforming all the other models, we are, we can't say it for sure. So that is what was our argument, but we haven't uh, haven't implemented, and we are not we cannot claim that once you train with this data, it will be the safest. Right. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. I got it. Um, uh, I have a I have a question uh, for Jing Jing Zhu uh, about PerfSeq. Um, uh, are there any kinds of uh, performance bugs that uh, PerfSeq cannot handle? Um, uh, you, you know, some performance bug does not have uh, any symptom. Um, uh, when they happen, they have not a uh, log message or some or any CPU pa patterns. Uh, they, they just slow down <clears throat> and, and perfectly handle these kind of uh, bugs. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, good question. So, uh, firstly, we that most of performance bug can have manifested at, at least one data type. So maybe the manifest, some some bugs manifest system mesh anomalies, some bugs manifest as system log anomalies. But if you are talking about the, the bugs which do not have any man, manifestation, then obviously we cannot do do things like that. So, uh, mm, so so and so you can uh, search uh, when you look at the bug repository when you look at the performance bugs so you can see that like uh cpu spike so most of bugs they are caused by like the infinite the loop bugs, the busy loop bugs so it can have some manifestation in system metrics um yeah so uh, we assume the uh, we 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 type which have symptoms, and specifically in our papers, so we target at some fine grained anomaly patterns in system metrics, and some fine grained patterns manifested by, uh, in system logs, specifically for performance bugs. Like if you are talking about the functional bugs, so typically in system logs you can observe additional error message, right? Right, so something like there is an error, there is an exception, something like that. But for performance bugs, we observe that there is no such kind of uh, additional error message. So instead, we find that uh, some log sequence so can represent a set of operations, like maybe a log sequence represent you are doing connection through client server communication, right? So such log sequence can have some uh, features when performance bug occur. So we find that some log entries are missing in the log sequence, or maybe the log sequence could exhibit a longer time span. So uh, I, I, I'm not sure whether it answers your question. So we find that maybe performance bugs can manifest as some uh, hidden symptoms, not easy to find symptoms and still we can do that. But if the performance bug have no symptoms at all and then we cannot do that. Okay, I, I think you, uh, mm -hmm. you you answered my question. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Yeah, that's another question for Jinchu. And uh, um, what if the host server run multiple threads or multiple is instance? Will the metrics like uh, CPU usage be less less representative? You know, if uh, the host server has multiple 
you know instance of the C, the CPU just uh, yeah, is represent the total usage of multiple threads. Uh, have you? Oh, uh, because okay, um, multiple thread. So, uh, we have some distributed performance bugs. Uh, but if you are talking about multi thread, uh, so so I think you are talking about whether we can localize specific thread, which can cause CPU usage. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, like. Uh, so first question is, can you find the the performance bug when the host server has multiple instance? And second is, if you found the the bug, can you do the causal co analysis on this multiple instance to find which one is is buggy? Uh, uh first, so if this machine runs multiple instance and uh and cause uh, CPU usage increase, and then we can uh, identify it. But uh, but we are not talking about at the system level. Like we cannot uh, identify the thread ID, TID, something like that. So uh, specifically, Perfsig did things at the function level, specifically at the application function level. So we can identify, OK, so which function causes this? So um, we, we do not investigate. So because you know okay. that is, maybe this function can cause several threads. Can can okay. uh, yeah, it can be run at a, a multiple thread. I remember that in our paper there there might be some bad which are caused by like the a thread uh, a concurrent thread and there is no limit on the thread execution so which can cause some performance bugs but still we do not investigate at the like like the thread level we investigate at the function level okay okay thank you thank you so we have uh, time for maybe a uh, last question I have a question uh, to Brekshe on the paper about uh, privacy. Um, my question uh, is, is the, the application of this, this work uh, in the real world. So privacy is, is very much uh, a cultural thing. It could be different, differently perceived in different countries. And also there are different privacy laws in different countries very different mm -hmm. um so and the app reviews you analyze there are many of them millions and mm -hmm. they come from many countries right so uh how did how has this affected your study or maybe a future study um yeah i think that's a very good point because uh, even while doing uh, these manual annotations we found a lot of disagreements on what we could term for trust like what reviews could be related to trust versus what could mm. be related to privacy. So I think in uh, we will try to also accommodate in the like for which country what kind of privacy uh, uh, rules hold. I think that is a good point. Uh, we haven't done that as of now, but that's a mm. good future study to do. Yes. Another aspect of that is uh, uh, also related perhaps to the age of the the yeah. user, right? Yeah. Uh, if uh, maybe privacy for uh, uh, adults is different than privacy for um, kids. Yeah, yeah, some diversity there would be kind of uh, interesting to understand because sometimes for parenting apps, what we observe that's uh, use of personal information to maybe track uh, the progress that is okay as compared to maybe when you're driving. So, so those kind of contextual uh, differences are also important to understand we do identify these but we have we haven't done any study on that yet okay so thank you very much uh, yeah we're getting to the end of the session um thanks again the six speakers for the very interesting talks and hope to see you sometime in the future in the future read conference someday thank you yeah thanks everyone Thank you so much. Bye. Yes, thank you. Let's get around. Bye. Bye now.
，拜拜，拜。